The Tory Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has just done his latest budget, and I'm joined by the brilliant economist, James Meadway, who is the author of The Cost of Living Crisis and How to Get Out of It, and also the host of the brilliant podcast, Macrodose. And he's going to tear it apart. That's what's going to happen, James. No pressure. Firstly, what's the problem? OBR, the Office for Budget Responsibility, they forecast no recession this year, which everyone was going on about. Inflation mm-hmm. will fall to 2.9% this year. Hallelujah. Everything's fine. Well, look, first of all, these are forecasts. I mean, this is the incredible thing. Everyone's like jumping up and down as if this has already happened. We have already not had a recession in 2023. We're only in March, right? Lots and lots of things can happen in the future. One of the things I think that isn't going to happen is that inflation isn't going to come down to 2.9% by the end of the year. The Bank of England, uh, by the way, its own forecast says it's going to come down to maybe 5%. And that seems to be uh, more likely where we're going to get to on this. But it's a forecast. And if you want to look at the forecast, so I'm sure Jeremy Hunt wants to talk about, oh, well, I'm avoiding a recession. I mean, congratulations. It's still not exactly great. 0.1% slight contraction for the whole economy forecast for the whole year. If you then look at what the OBR is saying for the next five years, it's actually saying less growth in the future. You then go and look at what the OBR is saying about what will happen to what really matters, which is people's living standards. It says by the time you get to 2026, people will still be worse off than they were in 2008 because of the inflation, because wages are not going up enough. So if you want to talk about forecasts, that's the forecast we can look at, not the like whoopee do for us. We avoided a technical recession. And I suppose also the point is when people hear inflation will fall from its current level, that doesn't mean mm-hmm. prices fall from where they've risen to. It just means the rates of price increases goes down. So the increased, so the surge in prices is baked in. And also yes. the growth compared to other rich countries is very weak. Yes, exactly. So, so growth in general, uh, very weak. I mean, this is obviously something Jeremy Hunt and, and others don't really want to talk up. But yes, that's absolutely right. In terms of the OBR forecast, you're still at the bottom end of what everybody else like the IMF is saying is likely to happen uh, this year in the bigger, richer com- countries. And you're absolutely right. And I'm sure this is how the government is going to try and play this over the next year or so, because inflation is coming down. You know, the cost of gas internationally is falling. The cost of energy is falling. Food price rises, by the way, are still very, very high, and that's likely to continue for a while. But inflation coming down means that you're just getting made poorer, slower, right? That's what's going to happen over this year. All that 10% inflation last year, that's now permanent, unless you get at least a 10% pay rise, and that's what people should be asking for. Corporation tax is going to rise Mm to 25%. Now, traditionally, and George Osborne et al., they did this, their right-wing ideological argument was you cut taxes and big business and it pays for itself because tax revenues go up so what does it say about that mantra and is it all whoopee do have they actually given big business a a a bung in another way jeremy hunt actually admitted himself in his own speech that the idea of cutting headline taxes as he put it hasn't encouraged business investment in quite the way that they thought it would so they kind of admit that this didn't work what you actually did was cut taxes from some very very large companies and their lucky shareholders uh, without actually getting very much in the way of investment coming forward, which is what's supposed to happen and didn't. And by the way, tax revenues are lower on the OBR figures again because of those uh, tax cuts for corporations. This is what you would, you know, commonsensically expect to happen. And it's exactly what did happen. So Hunt's doing something different. The headline rate is going up, but then to compensate the poor dears who now have to pay, well, it's still a lower headline rate than across much of the developed world, which is what we have in Britain, to compensate the poor darlings, he's introducing a uh, an investment relief over a three-year period only. It's a very, very strange thing to do. Basically, looks a lot like a pre-election bung to some rather big companies and attempt to get them to invest a bit of money before an election. It then ends just after the election is scheduled, uh, coming out into 2025, 2026. The Office of Budget Responsibility, them again, say that because this is so short term, it's going to have no long term impact on the rate of capital investment and growth in the country. What's going on with pensions? Well, this is this is uh, something that was trailed. Quite a lot of this was released before we actually got to the budget. What's going on with pensions is a very significant cut in the amount of taxes you'll have to pay if you're a better off pensioner approaching retirement. Now, the government's saying that this is all about, you know, we're going to encourage uh, doctors to not retire early from the NHS. We need experienced doctors there. True, although the big problem with what's happening in the NHS, where you've got, what, 130,000 Uh, places overall vacancies of people missing that you need to work there. The big problem there is actually pay. It's not the fact that a few doctors are taking early retirement right to the top. And you'll notice, and we can come back to this point, not a peep about pay in the public sector. That's the big crisis that this government is facing right now. That's why there's hundreds of thousands, millions of people 
out on strike today and over the last few months because they're not being paid enough at a time that inflation has gone through the roof. So that's the crisis to address. Not a peep about that. Instead, what starts to look like, and let's be blunt about this, it's a bit of a bum for some really quite well off people in terms of having a nice fat tax cut just as they're approaching retirement. So for a few thousand wealthy pensioners, that's it. This is very good news. Childcare. Now, one of the kind of main structural reasons that there is a permanent cost of living crisis in this country is childcare costs are just extortionate Mm -hmm. in this country compared to a lot of other richer countries. What in terms of the policies, a lot of people look at the Tory policies and they're saying, actually, this is good, unambiguously. Yeah, I think we should just take this and say, yes, it's good. Hunt was got pushed into doing it. There's political pressure really building up around the question of childcare now because it's absolutely scandalous, uh, the amount that people have to pay. And, you know, there's report after report. There was one just a couple of weeks ago from one of the think tanks on the drag, not just on the fact that, you know, if you're in work and suddenly you're having to fork out for childcare, it's a massive uh, loss of real earnings that you're facing here. And it's starting to affect, obviously it affects particularly women, given the, how the burden of childcare tends to be uh, spread out. That's not just bad for them and for families with young children. It's bad for like, the entire economy. That's the sort of argument that the government has bought into. And there's something to that. There's definitely something to that, that we ought to be encouraging people to be able to participate who want to work and who can work. They should be able to work. And of course, we should have much, much better childcare provision. We can afford it in this country. We can afford it in Scandinavia. You know, really good levels of childcare provision. You can afford it here. So it's good that this has happened, but it could go an awful lot further. You could, for instance, start to do something about the rates of pay in the care sector in general, which is scandalously low in this country, and conditions in, in general, very, very poor indeed. And again, loads and loads of vacancies across the sector. If you want to get more people into doing this, if you want to provide decent care, you're going to have to pay people to do it properly. The welfare state, um, particularly want to hear about in terms of disabled people. There has been a rise in the number of people who are disabled, people with ill health linked to the pandemic. I suspect a significant amount is down to long COVID, for example, actually. Yeah. But um, th- So in terms of benefit sanctions, in terms of the work capability assessment, which they're abolishing, what do you make of all of that, just in, in sum? Well, in terms of what's happening on the sanctions, this is this is unambiguously bad, right? The evidence on benefits sanctions, which have been applied for years now in this country, with the belief, or at least the claim, from successive governments that this will encourage people back into work. The evidence frankly, by this point, after more than a decade of doing this, Mm. it just isn't really there, right? You can go and find the academic reports that will tell you this is not having the claimed impact that it wants to have. If people do go back into work, it's insecure, it's poorly paid, it's not good for them, it's not good for the economy as a whole. This is a bad idea. There's even a report from DWP that was commissioned that they've been sitting on, they've not dared release it yet, into the impact of benefit sanctions. So this is just bad, but it's a classic, it has to be said, this is a classic Tory situation you end up in, where you're handing a nice bonus to some actually really quite well-off pensioners right at the top, and then a load of people and benefits are suddenly finding worse sanctions being applied to them. This isn't how we're going to encourage people into work. I personally take the view that, look, if people want to retire early, that's their choice. Let them get on with that. And if people are too sick to work, and that's what we're now seeing in the wake of the pandemic, you shouldn't be there saying, (laughs) chasing them out of their houses, out of wherever they are, and saying, you need to be in some workplace, still ill, still doing what you can, scrabbling away over there. It's it's a terrible, terrible idea, but it is, it has to be said, one of these classic Tory uh, manoeuvres in the way the balance of who wins and who gains uh, from this budget plays out. We've we've gone on kind of a headline items within the budget. What's missing? Oh, pay is the obvious one. I mean, the, the day that you have so many people on strike right across the public sector, uh, civil servants, teachers, whoever, as we've seen uh, for the last six months now, this has been the case, pay is the thing missing. I don't think there was a single sentence about it. A little bit in the cost of living crisis is a general issue. Quite a lot of inflation because he's clinging on to these OBR forecasts and let's see how that plays out. And of course, the extension for three months in the energy price guarantee, the, the cap that the government's now applying to keep typical bills below two and a half thousand pounds a year. I mean, this is still massively higher than they were 18 months or 12 months ago. Uh, but it's nonetheless, they're extending the cap for a few months there. So that will have some impact in that you won't lose out quite as much as you might have done. But on pay, Absolutely nothing. Not a peep about this. And and it's bizarre, really, to go into a situation where you could resolve. You could solve these disputes tomorrow. You just pay people what they're asking for. The money's there. That's why Hunt had this money to splash around on doing this nice big bung for businesses, a bit of a bung for some pensioners, uh, a certain amount of extra spending for defence. He could do this because some of the forecasts that he's relying on look a little bit better than they did back in autumn. So there's money's there if he wants to, to pay people uh, the, the decent wages that people are demanding. Not a peep about that. 
And of course, predictably, not a peep about wealth and the taxation of wealth and what we're going to do about the soaring levels of wealth inequality in this country, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. Some very simple things you could have done. Making the rate that you pay on capital gains that you uh, make, if you sell shares or art or whatever, you have to pay capital gains tax. That tax rate is below what you have to pay if you have to go out and work. Now, just equalizing those two things, that's at least 10, maybe up to 15 billion pounds you get out of this. Some simple things you could do to address wealth inequality and get some money in to pay for public services. These are easy, easy things for a chancellor to do. He chose not to do them. And instead we get this. Frankly, overall, it's a sort of pre-pre-election budget. It's a lot of sitting on your hands, waiting until you get to next year. And then that's when you get the tax cuts uh, going through that the Tories have been, or at least the Tory backbenchers have been clamouring for for so long. Finally, a bit of ominous thunder rumbling in the, not even the distance, <laughs> seems quite close, yeah. to be honest. Bank shares have gone down. We've got this mm -hmm. kind of Silicon Valley crisis going on. What is going on kind of succinctly and how worried should we be? How 2008 is this? We're not at 2008 yet. And, and we weren't last weekend when people will have seen that Silicon Valley Bank, this sort of fairly specialist uh, bank based in Silicon Valley in, in California, lots and lots of lending to lots and lots of small tech companies out there, relatively small uh, tech companies out there, ran into uh, severe difficulties on the back of rising interest rates and some pretty poor decisions by its managers about where they were going to put the money that they had. Um, it, there was a run on the bank, people withdrawing money from it very rapidly. The government steps in, the US government steps in on uh, Monday, Sunday, Monday, to say we're going to bail everyone out with the idea also of stopping similar bank runs that were starting to happen in similar banks, similar sort of medium-sized banks that they have in the US, don't really have them here in the same way, but they have some like this in the US that was starting to brew a panic and people were drawing their funds. And the risk then, of course, if people pull their funds out of the bank, the bank doesn't actually have all their money at hand, it collapses. So that's what happened uh, over last weekend. There was a similar impact happening with Silicon Valley Bank here, but that's now been sold to HSBC. Now that's one set of problems uh, rumbling on over this side. What's happened on markets and amongst people who trade shares and try and basically speculate on what's going to happen to the financial system is that it seems to be a more generalised belief there are some weaknesses in the banking system. And so Credit Suisse, one of the largest banks on the planet, um, which has been actually been backwards and forwards with lots of rumours about its health for a long period of time now, as of this morning, as of yesterday, was reporting it has material difficulties, I think was the phrase they used. And so it's been really hammered uh, in trading and by speculators. It's big investors, which is a Saudi national bank, and just said they're not putting any more money into it, which of course worsens the problem. There is some risk, you'd think, of this is a bank that could fail, but we are in a world of too big to fail at this point in time. So that doesn't look quite so likely uh, as of yet. It's a great deal of speculation. It's a great deal of people sort of cooking up a panic because actually you can make a bit of money out of that. That's partly yeah. what's happening at the minute. But as interest rates rise, as the kind of economic conditions look tighter, we are going to see more kind of unexploded bombs, they're called them, like Silicon Valley Bank going off. And some of them are going to be fairly small, like Silicon Valley Bank. And some of them, unfortunately, could be rather large. A James Midway tour de force, as ever. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Thank you. Torn the Tory budget to shreds and also given us some pretty ominous economic news. Uh, yeah, we we have, to deal, <laughs> have to deal with the world as it is. Uh, but brilliant stuff. Do, as I've said, get a copy of The Cost of Living Crisis and How to Get Out of It. James writes is clearly about complicated issues as he speaks about them. And also make sure you uh, get a bit of Macrodose, the podcast which he hosts. Thank you so much, James. Much appreciated. Thanks, sorry. Please like and subscribe. And I'll see you all soon.